Hi, I'm James Gardner, host of Your History, Your Story, a podcast for everybody who loves stories about interesting people and events told by those who uncovered them from within their own family trees. This, we hope, will inspire you to discover and celebrate your history and your story. When George Washington became the first president of the United States in 1789, his wife Martha, like her husband, had no predecessor to model for her new role. Initially, she did not have a title, but soon became known as Lady Washington. It wasn't until approximately 70 years later that the term First Lady was used on a regular basis to identify the wife of the president and or the White House hostess. Over the past 233 years, the First Ladies of the United States have performed many duties to support the president and his administration. In addition to upholding many traditions set by previous First Ladies, they had to adapt their roles to fit the times and circumstances of their stay in the White House. Some of our nation's First Ladies have also been members of the Daughters of the American Revolution, commonly known as the DAR. The DAR was formed in 1890 and is a women's organization made up of direct descendants of patriots of the American Revolution. Since its founding, the DAR has continued to initiate and support projects that include promoting patriotism, education, historic preservation, and conservation. In this episode of Your History, Your Story, our guest is historian Larry Cook, author of Symbols of Patriotism, The First Ladies and Daughters of the American Revolution, a book that tells the stories of 12 First Ladies who were and are also members of the DAR. In addition to being an author, speaker, and historian, Larry is a serious collector of presidential memorabilia with a collection that includes over 8,000 fascinating items. I'd now like to welcome Larry Cook to our show. Welcome, Larry. Hey, thanks, James. It's great to be on. I appreciate you having me on. I'm very excited to be speaking with you again. Uh, we visited together recently, which was a lot of fun. We'll talk about that in a few moments. Yeah. But uh, I wanted to start by asking you, where were you born and where did you grow up? And how, even in your earliest years, were you tied into presidential history? Yes, I, I actually was born in Syracuse, New York. I grew up in uh, Manlius, uh, New York, which is about 10 miles outside of Syracuse. We lived there even when, at the time I was born, but I was, the hospital was in Syracuse. So, And that uh, Manlius is right next to Fayetteville, New York, which uh, Fayetteville and Manlius have always been tied together. Uh, I graduated from Fayetteville Manlius High School. And uh, so I, I grew up there and uh, into my uh, early uh, adulthood lived there. And uh, yeah, I was always connected with history because Grover Cleveland had spent uh, a good deal of his childhood in Fayetteville, New York, and his boyhood home still stands there. Well, that's kind of cool. And I actually have a tie to Grover Cleveland myself because I live about a mile away from where he was born in Caldwell, New Jersey. So we got that commonality there. Uh, yeah, yeah, definitely. <laughs> yeah, so Larry, talk to me about at what age did you really just start thinking about history as something that interested you and something that sort of sparked your fascination? Well, I can really thank my grandmother for that. Uh, I was very fortunate uh, all through my childhood, and I'm still very fortunate now how supportive my family is in everything that I've done and everything that I do. But my grandmother gave me my first, actually my first piece of memorabilia It is a uh, penny, the Lincoln Kennedy penny with Kennedy's image impressed in a Lincoln penny that's attached to a uh, paper card that tells all the amazing coincidences between Presidents Lincoln and Kennedy. My grandmother, as I mentioned, gave me that uh, when I was about 10 or 11 years old. And that really got me started in collecting. And I went to the library at the uh, school that I I attended in in Manlius at the time and looked up all of those facts on Lincoln and Kennedy 
to see if they were true. You know, back when I was a kid, we didn't have Google to go on to. So <laughs> I actually went to the library and opened some books and, and looked those things up. And, um, and I got fascinated by, by that and by what I learned by looking those things up. And then my parents and my grandmother would get me little items after that, you know, campaign buttons, uh, you know, that would have been in the seventies. And so I get like maybe a Nixon now button or something like that. And when I got that, I would go and look up everything about Nixon and, you know, et cetera. And, um, so they were very supportive of, of that and getting me little, uh, presidential things. And every time I would go to the library and look up those facts and, and over the years, I developed two collections, really one of uh, memorabilia and one of uh, little known facts. That's great. You know, just for our younger listeners, when we talk about looking up and verifying information, that was no small task because, yeah, yeah you would. As you said, you, had, you would have to go to the library or what we had in our house was a dusty set of Encyclopedia Britannica uh-huh. and we would have to... <laughs> you know, thumb through those books. And I remember we had them on our shelf for years. And when I was in high school, I remember trying to look up information. And I think, you know, the current president was Dwight Eisenhower, I think, <laughs> when the when the books <laughs> came out. And uh, so you really had to dig and dig. It, we didn't have the information at our fingertips like we do now. So I yeah. don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. It's probably a good thing because you could, you had to really immerse yourself in it and take the time to do it. But uh I see that you already, as a little kid, you had the, uh, the, the foundation of a historian because you weren't just going to be told something. You had to find it out for yourself, right? Yes. Yeah. And, and as you said, you don't know whether that's good or bad. And I, you know, yesterday versus today and, and being able to research things. And I agree with you. Uh, you know, you had to do a little more digging. And, and I still do that today. You know, I research every day as a historian, uh, every day. And, um, it's still a combination of, uh, of books and, uh, online. Uh, you know, I have a, I have a very large library here in my office and, uh, you know, I've probably got more than a thousand books, uh, on, on presidents and, you know, I still use them uh, daily, just like I use Google daily. For me, it makes a good combination to use the old method and the new method. It, it really works out well because you, you find books, particularly in books, that are from the time period. Like I, I have, uh, <clears throat> I have a book on James Buchanan, for example, that was written back when he was actually president. So, you know, that information there, you can rely on it pretty well because it's right from the time. It's not written, you know, a hundred years later. Yeah. Wow. That, yeah, that's interesting. James Buchanan, one of, one of, uh, I guess, History doesn't look too favorably upon James Buchanan. And uh, to, to actually have a book from his time period, late 1850s, is uh, really cool to be able to find out more information about his administration. But I want to ask yeah. you this, though, Larry, why, why the presidents? I mean, you know, there's so much in history, and I know you're a lover of history in general, but what was it? Was it your, was it your grandmother's gift to you that it happened to do with two presidents or... What, what was it about the presidents that really attracted you uh, to learn more about? Well, you know, I think what really triggered something in my, in my brain as a child was probably November 22nd, 1963. And that is truly my earliest memory in life. I was only uh, three years old at that time. And of course, that was the, the day that President Kennedy was assassinated. And as I mentioned, I was only three years old at the time, and I still can remember that, uh, that time, maybe not that whole day, but I can remember my parents' reaction to, uh, the news that the president had been assassinated. And uh, I probably was too young to really understand totally what that meant, but it stuck with me because I, I remember how upset my parents were. And I couldn't tell you anything the day before that. I couldn't tell you anything the day after that, but truly that is my, my first memory in life. And I really think that that triggered something in my in my mind you know uh john kennedy jr was was my age and i remember you know somewhat later after that thinking about him being my age maybe when i was seven eight years old you know thinking about him being being my age and not having a father and 
So I, I think that's really what triggered something in my mind to have me be interested in presidents. And then, of course, I apparently had expressed that interest to my grandmother and to my parents for, for my grandmother to get me this piece of memorabilia that she got me that started me off. And then it just went from there. So I really think that that was the, the, uh, the thing that triggered something in me to, to have an interest in president. That makes a lot of sense. Now you and I both, I'm, I'm a couple of years older than you are. We both grew up in the sixties though. And I have to say that I, there was just so much going on, a uh, huge historical event, uh, some happy, some sad. We had the, the first moon landing, the first man on the moon. We had assassinations. John Kennedy, I was uh, five and a half, and I faintly remember, I do remember parts of that day. I remember my mother telling me the president was shot, and I remember my mother being very upset and sad during the funeral, and she would... She would say, I remember her saying, looking at Jackie Kennedy, who she had the dark, the black veil on, and she was just sort of staring straight ahead. And I, I remember my mom saying, I wish she would just cry because she seems she's just on the verge and maybe she would feel better if she cried. And that's, that's really all I remember. But we had mm-hmm. Bobby Kennedy's assassination. We had Martin Luther King. We had the Vietnam War. We had, we had the rock and roll uh, culture going on. It was really quite a decade. And uh, I, I got to believe that as kids, and you see that, you, you realize that history is important, that these events were very important. And the fact that John F. Kennedy was early in that decade is, hey, he, he was a president. And what is a president? Who is that? Yeah. And, and that, that could spark your interest, right? It sparked mine for, for sure. Yeah. Now, You've really studied the presidents a lot and all things about presidents. And we're going to talk about how that leads into your book and first ladies. But I want to focus somewhat on your collection. Since you've been interested in history and presidential history specifically, you didn't stop with that penny from your grandmother, did you? (laughs) No. (laughs) Tell Uh, us about it. And I still haven't stopped. Uh, and, you know, as, as you know, you were here in my, in yep. my office and I uh, got a chance to see, and, and, uh, I want to, I want to say again, what a great time we had. It, oh, it's, it's, it's just so much fun, uh, you know, sharing the collection, uh, with people that really, truly appreciate it. And, um, I had a, a great time with, with you and Kelly that day, but, uh, yeah, I've just, I've, I've collected ever since then. And as I mentioned, you know, early on in life, my parents would get me campaign buttons and, you know, things like that. Nothing really expensive back then when I was a kid, but just little, you know, campaign buttons and stuff that, that you could pick up. And I always kept all of those. I, I wanted to mention, I, I still have that very first uh, item that my grandmother gave me. It's sitting right here on my desk in a frame. Yep. And, you know, I cherish that because it's, it's got so, so much special meaning to me. But, um, yeah, so then, you know, as a kid, I, I picked up little things like that here and there. And then, you know, as I got older, I continued on. I mean, I don't remember a time that I wasn't uh, picking up presidential memorabilia and collecting things. And then, like <laughs> like all of us, you know, when we're younger, we don't have a lot of money and we're going to school and going to college and, and really don't have a lot of money then. And and uh, But I still continue to pick up, you know, more inexpensive things. And, you know, as I got older and got more established in, in careers and stuff and had a little more uh, money to, to spend on things, I increased a, a little bit. And as I, you know, as I said, I've never stopped and I still continue to get items. And now my collection has grown to to somewhere over 8,000 pieces. I can't say exactly the number of pieces I have, but it's somewhere over 8,000. That is incredible. And as you said, uh, my wife Kelly and I went up and visited you and your wife Diane, and we had a great time. And as you showed me your collection, I was, uh, you've heard the term kid in a candy shop. <laughs> <laughs> that was me. I just, I mean, I could have spent all day in there with you going over everything, but there were a few things that stood out to me. Very interesting. One of them was, it was a document that had two early presidents uh, signatures on it and one was not president at the time 
but uh, it was a land grant signed by Thomas Jefferson and James Madison. Could you tell us about that document? Yeah, um, it's exactly what you said. It's from 1806. It's a, a land grant, and it, it's, uh, <clears throat> of course, very special being signed by Thomas Jefferson. You know, um, his signature is not uh, uh, really easy to get. So that's, that makes the document special in and of itself. But his Secretary of State was James Madison, and, and James Madison co-signed the, the document. So that makes that document even more special because you've got actually two presidents' signatures on uh, on an early document. And um, yeah, I I really love that document because you know if you would ask me 20 years ago, would I ever have a Thomas Jefferson signature, you know, signed document in my collection? Uh, you know, I I don't think that I would have, you know, at that time. I mean, that was kind of like one of those, wow, if, if I could only ever get that, you know, and, um, but I'm, I'm very fortunate now to, to have that. And, and as we said, not just with uh, Jefferson's signature, but also with uh, Madison's signature on it. So that's a, it's a pretty special uh, document. Oh, it is. And, you know, when I, when I looked at it, I couldn't help but think that that document just sat right in front of those two historical figures and now here's James Gardner standing looking at it and it was it's it was just really cool it just stood out to me along with a couple others I'm just going to briefly mention one was uh I've, Teddy Roosevelt is uh, I think one of the most interesting presidents one of the most interesting human beings I have read about you had two items that I saw from him and one was uh, when he was police commissioner of New York City. I don't know if everybody if everybody knows that, but he was the police commissioner in New York City before he advanced and obviously became president. Could you tell us about that document? Yeah, I have a, a document <laughs> that has Theodore Roosevelt's signature on it and it's a uh, a city of New York certificate certifying a, uh, an individual by the name of Patrick Gargan to be a, uh, a police officer in New York City. And um, as I mentioned, it's got Theodore Roosevelt's signature on there. And it's the only one I've ever seen. Uh, I'm sure there are other ones out there, but there's probably not a lot of them out there. And um, Roosevelt wasn't police commissioner very long. Uh, it was less than two years that he was uh, in that post. And Yes, as you mentioned, um, a lot of people don't realize that he was New York City Police Commissioner. I I always tell people in my presentations when I'm talking about uh, Teddy Roosevelt and and the police commissioner thing, um, I'll say, you know, has anybody watched Blue Bloods? And if you if you have, you'll you'll see in Tom Selleck's uh, office there, you'll see a a a framed portrait of Teddy Roosevelt in his office because, of course, Tom Selleck plays the police commissioner on Blue Bloods. Yeah, I I love this. This is one of my favorite pieces. There's such a great history with Teddy Roosevelt being police commissioner and what he did there in cleaning up the uh, city and the corruption in the police department. So, again, that's a very, very special document and one of the favorites in my collection. Yes, and uh, I think one thing to note is that he must have been pretty young as a police commissioner because he was the youngest president to become president I think he was only 42, and he became president when William McKinley died from an assassin's bullet. Some people think it was John F. Kennedy. John F. Kennedy, if I'm correct on my trivia, was the youngest man elected president. That's correct. You got that correct. Gotcha. Just one other thing on Teddy Roosevelt. When I was able to see, there were two letters that Teddy Roosevelt wrote to, a, I think, a desk manufacturer, somebody who was making a desk for his home or office. Could you tell us about that one? I guess it's a little humorous. (laughs) Yeah, this is one of my favorite uh, pieces in my collection. You know, I I, I probably say that about just about every piece, but this is one of my favorite pieces. And and I love the the two two letters and I love the story behind it. Just quickly, uh, it was locally here in, in northeastern Pennsylvania where I live. A lady had called me and she had seen me on the on the news. Um, She said, I have a a presidential piece that you may be interested in. So I went over to her house and and, uh, she came down from the attic with this frame. And it was, uh, you know, just kind of an inexpensive frame that was probably bought in the 1940s or 50s. And 
And uh, there, sure enough, was a letter with Theodore Roosevelt signature on it. And it was while he was president on White House stationery. And um, I'm looking at it and I said to her, uh, you don't have a letter here from, from Theodore Roosevelt. And she looked at me very puzzled, like, you know, yes, I do. And um, I said, you actually have two letters here. <laughs> and uh, the one letter had slipped into the back of the, the first letter over time. The, you know, the, the back of the frame was just cardboard and it was all warped and everything. And it allowed the, the, the second letter to slip behind the first letter. And she was amazed. She didn't, I could just see the edge of it. And so we took the frame apart and, and took both letters out. And the first letter dated September 29th, 1905. And like I said, he was sitting president then. And he was asking this craftsman to have a, uh, a desk made. And uh, he had gotten very special wood, Hamigan wood, uh, it was actually called, and uh, had provided that to this craftsman. And he was all... Uh, jovial in this first letter, you know, about the making of the desk. Well, then the second letter, uh, something apparently went wrong, but the second letter dated October 4th, uh, which isn't too long. As I mentioned, the first one was September 29th. This one's October 4th, 1905. And he's not too happy with this craftsman. Uh, I'll, I'll give you a couple of, of quotes. Uh, he starts out the letter by saying, I have your letter of the third instant and closing sketches, and I am really put out. I did not like the first sketch at all, and uh, he's asking to get the uh, he's asking to get the wood back, and I think he's got other plans to get that desk made. So, uh, and the letter goes on, and I and I love these two letters because the president uh, has got hand corrections; they're typed letters on White House stationery, but he's written in uh, and crossed out words and written in things in the in the letters, and you know, and sent them out just like that. And I love that informality of of that. So it's really neat. And I gave, uh, gosh, probably a year, year and a half ago now, I, I, I did a uh, presentation on Zoom for Sagamore Hill, mm-hmm. of course, uh, Theodore Roosevelt's home. And we had mentioned these letters. And afterwards, they uh, had sent me an email and said that that desk that he finally did get made sits in Sagamore Hill. He found a different manufacturer, I guess. I guess so. Yeah. Uh, you know, I'm not sure uh, who actually ended up doing the desk, but, but it's really cool. And that's, it's so neat to, because I, I do what I do and I'm a historian and, and give presentations and had the opportunity to give one at Sagamore Hill, you know, we're able to um, kind of, you know, enhance history there a little bit by linking these letters actually with the desk. Uh, because when I first got these letters, I thought, I wonder where that desk is or if it, you know, ever did get, get made. And uh, sure enough, it sits in Sagamore Hill. Well, the thing is that all those items that you have in your collection, they all have a story, don't they? Yes. Everyone has a story. It's not just an item. There's something behind the item. And I'm just going to, we could go on all, all the, for the next hour on this, but I wanted to ask you about one more item that I know has a story, a kind of a personal story behind it that is one of your favorites, and I was able to see it. It's actually an inauguration program from President Obama's inauguration, his second term. It's got a couple signatures on it. Could you tell us about that item? Yes, yes, and that that item really is at the top of my list for my favorites because it it means so much to me because it was given to me by a dear friend. It's President Obama's inaugural program in a in a beautiful hardcover leather right. uh, book, like uh, with the program inside, and it says fifty seventh presidential inauguration, uh, United States Capitol, January twenty first, two thousand thirteen, and this was. President and Mrs. Carter's copy that they had while they were at the inauguration. President and Mrs. Carter are very good friends of my, me and my wife. And uh, one day, shortly after the inauguration, they came to our home for lunch. And uh, the Carters gave us this and thought that we would like it for our collection. Oh, and um, so it means, uh, it means a lot to me. This was their own personal copy that they had there at the inauguration. And as fate would have it, just a couple months after the Carters gave this to us, I had the opportunity to meet President Obama. So I took this with me and I asked the president to sign it. And uh, he was 
happy to sign it. He told me to tell President Carter hello, and he signed the program for me, the inside of the program. So then a few months after that, President Carter was visiting uh, my home again, and I showed him that I had met President Obama, and President Obama had signed it. So then he signed it as well. So I have uh, both presidents' signatures on it, and it's a very, very, very special item to me. Yeah, it's a really cool collectible, and I uh, really appreciated the opportunity to see it. It's terrific. Now, when I was looking through your collection, I noticed that there was a lot of stuff that related not just to the presidents, but their campaigns, other people who they were close with, specifically first ladies. I saw a lot of a lot of photographs. I'm very interested in Grover Cleveland and his wife, Francis Folsom Cleveland, because as I said, I live nearby the birthplace, but I'm also a trustee for the Grover Cleveland Birthplace Memorial Association. So my eyes went right to that. But I also saw other first lady related materials and collectibles. That leads me to a segue into your book, Symbols of Patriotism, First Ladies and Daughters of the American Revolution. How did you decide or what inspired you or who inspired you to write a book about not just first ladies, but those first ladies who had ties to the daughters of the American Revolution? Well, you know, for years I had done presidential history, both in my early years as a hobby and now as a, you know, over the last several years as a full-time historian. And, um, and, you know, we, we kind of talked about this a, a few minutes ago about uh, how much other history is out there outside of presidential history. And when you study presidential history, you can't help but learn a lot about different wars that have went on and, and et cetera. You know, you, you learn a lot of other history outside of that. And, of course, in that history, when you're studying presidents, a very important component of presidential history is, of course, the first lady. Mm. So. I hadn't really focused on first ladies for a lot of years, but of course I had learned a lot about them in my, in my studies of, of the president. So about uh, three years ago now, uh, maybe a little more, I was asked by our, our local DAR group to be their keynote speaker for their annual Daughters of the American Revolution uh, dinner for that chapter. And so I thought I'd like to make my, my presentations audience specific if I can. And, and so I just thought, well, I wonder if there were any first ladies that were involved with the uh, with the daughters of the American Revolution. And in doing a quick search, um, I immediately found like six or seven that that were. And I was amazed to find uh, at that time that Caroline Harrison was actually their first president general uh, when the DAR was formed. Right. And so I thought, well, this is great, you know, and they'll, they'll really enjoy this. And I had memorabilia, you know, related to either those first ladies that I had found on that quick search or, or to their husbands. And I, so I did my presentation and brought some of the memorabilia with me and, and it was really a winner. The DAR group just really enjoyed it. And it was ironic because at that same time, I was starting to get requests from other places to do some some more presentations on first ladies or include more first ladies in the presentations that I was doing. So it really worked out well. So I was, I, I did that presentation. It was great. They, they really enjoyed it. And I thought, well, this is, this is a good test here. I, I have to do more on first ladies and they deserve to be brought out more in, in history. Absolutely. And, uh, and so one of my best friends is Nicholas Inman, who runs the Missouri Cherry Blossom Festival in Marshfield, Missouri, mm-hmm. uh, which is a whole nother, a whole, a whole nother conversation there of how great that that festival is. But he loves First Lady history, and he and I talk about it every week. And so at the time, I I told him, I said, I just did this presentation, and and it was really good. And uh, he said, well, I didn't know that there were a lot of first ladies in the DAR either. He said, you know, you really ought to write a book on that. Because he said, I know nobody's done that. And I really thought probably somebody had done that by, by then because the DAR is such a large organization. And I figured maybe, you know, probably somebody's written on that. And so he kept after me to write the book. I did a search and could not find any anything under one cover that talked about all the first ladies. I did some more research and found that there were actually 12 first ladies that were members of the DAR. 
And so I started to write the manuscript, and as fate would have it, another friend of mine who's a Civil War published author happened to be telling his publisher about my idea and what I was writing a manuscript on. And uh, Vandermeer Press called me and said, you know, would you have some sections of the book already done that that you could send us? And uh, so I did, and they gave me a publishing deal on it. So that's how Symbols of Patriotism, First Ladies and Daughters of the American Revolution came about. And I did a profile, you know, some of these women, like I mentioned, Caroline Harrison, had a great deal to do with the DAR, um, was very active in it. Other ones were members, but not a lot to say about their involvement in the DAR, just other than that they were members. So uh, I did a, a profile on, on the lives of these First Ladies, and I also did research to find their patriot ancestor that would allow them to be members in the DAR. If the listeners out there don't know, uh, to be a DAR member, it's a very strict uh, rule that you have to have a patriot ancestor in, in, that you can prove direct lineage to, uh, meaning a patriot ancestor from the Revolutionary War time. It's a, it's a very stringent process to, to become a member there. So I did a whole lot of research in finding their patriot ancestor or ancestors in some cases. Uh, With Eleanor Roosevelt, I had to stop with hers because I was finding so many. (laughs) I could only include, I think I've got five in the book or something like that. Other ones, I may just have one. uh, Some I have two, et cetera. But uh, Eleanor, there's such lineage there uh, with the Roosevelts that it just went on and on and on. Matter of fact, the one patriot that I found for Eleanor, uh, interestingly enough, was the uh, man that uh, actually administered the oath of office to uh, George Washington in 1789. No, I never knew that one. I never knew that one, Larry. That's that's a new one on me. It is so interesting to know that these, now these are the first ladies who were members of the DAR, but there could have been other first ladies who were descended from Patriots, but these these ladies were actually involved. And you you have twelve first ladies who are profiled, and I just wanted to say that the book is great. I read it and enjoyed it because the way you set it up is just the way I like to absorb information, and that is you gave a history, a little bit of a history of that first lady, and then you gave some little known facts little box that had little known facts about the first lady, interesting tidbits. And then you provided the tie to the Patriot ancestors. So it's all captured in short chapters that just give you an abundance of information. I just want to mention a couple that stood out to me that I really enjoyed. You mentioned Carolyn Harrison, who was president general of the DAR. And uh, it, it kind of mentioned that she was the uh, she was President Benjamin Harrison's wife, and she was in the White House while she was in the White House. They were doing renovations. She was overseeing the renovations, and uh, she was very active in that. But you make a note there that both Caroline and her husband Benjamin were actually afraid of electricity <laughs> that was being installed <laughs> in the White House. You know, they, yeah. were, they were afraid of it. It was new stuff. But it, nevertheless, she kind of oversaw that. And uh, another one was Sarah Polk. James K. Polk was her husband. And that she pretty much served as the unofficial chief of staff for her husband. She was very involved. She also did not allow alcohol to be served at events. Uh, she was very much involved, I guess, in the temperance movement. But her nickname was very interesting to me. They called her Sahara Sarah because <laughs> yeah. she was dry. She wanted a dry White House. So I thought that was cool. But there's so many different facts and uh, interesting stories in there that you can absorb when you're reading this book. So I think that's terrific. During the time you were researching this book, oh, and when you mentioned that you went back and, and checked to actually find how those first ladies were descended from a patriot you did your own homework it reminds me of you telling me about 
you know, researching the fact on the card that your grandmother gave you with a penny attached to it. You wanted to prove it for yourself. You did an yeah. independent verification. I think that's so cool. But what kind of, what are some of the most noteworthy things that you learned about the 12 first ladies that you researched for this book? Well, um, I wanted to mention one thing too, before I answer that, because you pointed out and I get asked this a lot and I wanted to, uh, uh, let the audience know this. uh, you had mentioned that there were probably other first ladies that were eligible to be in the DAR Mm -hmm. and that's absolutely correct. There were a lot of them. And for this book, I did a tremendous amount of research because I actually had to research all of our first ladies to find out whether or not they were, they were members of the DAR mm-hmm. and to find out which ones actually were. And so you're absolutely correct. There were a lot of other first ladies that were eligible to be DAR members and that have Patriot ancestry, um, but just did not happen to, to become a member of the DAR. So I, I wanted to point that out because I think that that is important to know that. You know, I would say in doing my research, probably more of our first ladies than not would have been eligible. So um, there's a tremendous amount of others that would have been eligible for that. But uh, in getting back to your question on what did I, you know, discover uh, with these first ladies, um, it really gave me an education writing this book and gave me a uh, such a strong appreciation for our first ladies. Because as I mentioned, when I give presentations about the book, that after doing this book, I've realized that probably, and and again, not just with these 12 first ladies, but first ladies in, in general, I think many of our presidents would not have been president had it not been for their first lady. Right. Even if they did get to the presidency, I think many of them would not have had as successful of a presidency had it not been for uh, the first lady that was there beside them. Right. It, it, uh, it really is a true partnership in many cases of our president and first lady. And I think a lot of people don't realize the significance that a first lady has. And not only that, I'm not talking about just when they're president, I'm talking about getting them there to the presidency. Yes. Um, and then even after the presidency. When you think about a first lady, it's a job that pays no salary. In modern times, they have a, a budget for the office of the first lady, but still there's no, no salary for the first lady. She's probably under the microscope of the public eye, only second to her husband, sometimes maybe even more than her husband because first lady gets commented on her hairstyle and the shoes she's wearing and the dress she may be wearing or whatever. And she's not only the, you know, the wife of the leader of the free world, but she's also a mother uh, in, in, in most cases and, and have all those responsibilities of, of family. So I always had a high respect for first ladies, but I really gained a, a much higher respect for them uh, in writing this book and realizing that while a, a lot of these guys probably wouldn't have been president had it not been for their wives. I definitely agree with that. And I wanted to point out in the beginning of the book, uh, there's a picture of Martha Washington, and uh, it really starts off with, hey, you know, Martha Washington was the first. There was Mm -hmm. no um, precedent set. You know, there was nothing, nobody before her that she could follow. And uh, you could say also with Abigail Adams, the second first lady, she was the first first lady who lived in the White House. So that was another first. So you do mention about those two first ladies. They're not the ones who are of the 12 that you wrote about specifically, but nevertheless, those were two very important first ladies because they were sort of setting the, setting the stage for what was to come. What was Martha Washington's first title? They didn't even know what to call her initially, right? They didn't, you know, and what's ironic with that is they didn't really know what to call the first lady, even up into like, Francis Cleveland's time. You know, I, I laugh at one little cabinet card I've got of Francis Cleveland and it's on a, it's a cabinet card that, that's got her image on it and showing that she's promoting these, uh, these bitters. She, she used to get in a lot of, uh, advertisements that she didn't really, uh, authorize, but 
um, on this cabinet card uh, at the bottom of her image, it says Mrs. President Cleveland. So it's clear that even up into the, you know, 1880s, 1890s, you know, the public was still confused about, about uh, what to call the first lady. So, yeah, Martha Washington, she was the trailblazer for that. And, and I wanted to point out, you had mentioned about her and, and uh, Abigail Adams and that they're, they're not part of that 12. And, of course, they're not part of that 12 because they, they had passed on, uh, you know, long before the, the DAR was um, founded. So, um, and that, that's the reason. But I couldn't write this book without including some, at least some mention of, of Martha Washington and putting a picture of, of her in there. But yeah, they, they, you know, they were called a variety of things, you know, Mrs. President and, you know, et cetera, because no one really knew what to, what to call them. And, you know, it's, you mentioned about Martha being the first, and of course she was, and she was, of course, the first to start to, to form the office of the, you know, of the first lady and, and establish that, maybe not the office, but the role, I should say, of the first lady at that time. And it's still, though, very similar in some respects, because, as I mentioned in the book, with the role of the first lady, there is no real job description. And in my opinion, the office forms the first lady and the first lady forms the office. Right. And that still happens today. You know, we all know that our, our first ladies have, you know, different agendas and favorite uh, causes that they they take on, so in that way they you know they form the office, and then they have to adapt to what's going on during their husband's presidencies, both good and bad, and that you know that changes you know what they they may do is the role of first lady. A, a, an example of that is you know Laura Bush during you know nine eleven, you know that certainly changed some of the things that she did as first lady. Of course, those types of things come up in any presidency, and it's going to change maybe what the first lady had in mind for her her particular uh, office or agenda. Yes, definitely. And I'm you know I, I'm looking at the names I wrote down of uh, all the first ladies that you wrote about in this book. I mean, you've got Julia Grant, Edith Roosevelt, the wife of, second wife of Teddy Roosevelt, Florence Harding. Warren Harding was. Not one of the most famous presidents, but uh, she was quite the power to reckon with behind him. (laughs) That's an understatement. Eleanor Roosevelt, uh, hey, she was just an amazing person. There was uh, so much compassion that Eleanor Roosevelt showed for the American people, for those people who were less fortunate and, um, you know, during the Depression in that time. And, of course, the work that she did even after her husband passed away and the UN and everything like that. I think uh, you've got Bess Truman, you've got um, Mamie Eisenhower, Rosalind Carter, Nancy Reagan, Barbara and Laura Bush. Just a tremendous hall of fame of first ladies. I did want to mention it was, there's one first lady, she's not in the book, but since we are talking about first ladies in general, one of my favorite first ladies is Dolly Madison. And Mm -hmm. the reason I say Dolly Madison is because she's known for rescuing the, I think it's Gilbert Stewart's painting of George Washington. She rescued it off the wall of the White House while the British were actually coming to burn the White House down back during the War of 1812. James Madison wasn't there. Many people have fled already. But she had the foresight to rescue that painting along with, I believe, some other things. And... uh, she was there right to the last minute, and I just thought she had a lot of bravery, and uh, I think she also became almost like the the uh, hostess of Washington even after her husband passed away, and so mm-hmm. she's just an amazing person too, but just an, an, another example of the first ladies, but I think what I see when I read this book is you've got, you've got 12 first ladies, but they're tied together by being first ladies, and also being tied into a patriot ancestor. Now, tell us why that connection to the patriot ancestor was so important in this book. Well, you know, as I mentioned, it was it was something that 
no one had really written about. I mean, you, you can find things that, yeah, you know, um, this first lady was a member of the Daughters of the American Revolution, but nobody had put them all under one cover before, which, as I mentioned, you know, really did surprise me that you couldn't find anything that really listed all of these, uh, these 12. And I think that it's, it's important for, you know, it's important for people to, to know that these first ladies were involved in such a, uh, a great organization as the Daughters of the American Revolution. I mean, it is a tremendous organization. Um, and they do so much good for our country and, and promoting, uh, patriotism and, and making sure that these patriots that helped to form our country are not forgotten. So it's important with, with any DAR member out there that's got, you know, that has research their patriot ancestor and, and become a member of the organization. But I just, I just thought it was so important to put these 12 under, you know, under one, one cover and, and talk about that and, and let people realize that, yes, our first ladies, many of them have had patriot ancestors as well. Yeah, that's great. Definitely. And I noticed on the back cover of the book, you received a couple of a uh, really nice endorsement from descendants of a couple of these first ladies. And one of them was Mary Jean Eisenhower, and the other one is Clifton Truman Daniel. Can you tell us a, a little bit about those endorsements? Yeah, um, I'm very fortunate to have Mary Jean and Clifton both be very good friends of mine. And through the work I do, um, we've, we, you know, we've done presentations together and, and over the years gotten to be friends. So when I was in the process of writing this book and, and discovered that uh, Mary Jean's grandmother, Mamie, was a, um, a DAR member and uh, Clifton, Clifton's grandmother, Bess Truman, was also a DAR member, I immediately called both of them and, you know, asked them some questions about their grandmother. And it was, it was neat because I got to really talk to people that could you know, tell me right from the source and give me stories. You know, for example, um, I, I put a story in the book about Mamie that, you know, no one else would have known uh, when Mary told me that, you know, her grandmother loved being a DAR member. And she actually had a little, uh, I don't know how little it was, but I actually a, a costume DAR pin, which was just costume jewelry. And she took it to a jeweler, I believe, when she lived in Gettysburg and had all the the little uh, fake stones taken out of it and had real rhinestones put in or real uh, gemstones put in in place of the rhinestones that were in there. And she wore that DAR pin every day of her life. You know, that's not something that you can pick up a history book and find that story somewhere. Had Mary not been my friend, I would have never known that. And so I was very fortunate to be able to to write this book and have people that I could you know, actually pick up the phone and call, um, you know, Clifton was great. He put me, I was writing this book during the COVID lockdown. So not just during the COVID yeah. time, but during the actual lockdown, I got the publishing deal, I think two or three months prior to the COVID lockdown. So I was writing it then. So it was very difficult. I couldn't, you know, none of the presidential libraries or anything like that were open. So I had to rely on my library here, what I could find online and, and my friends uh, like Clifton and Mary. So, you know, another example, Clifton put me in touch with somebody at the Truman Library, you know, where, that I could call directly that I would have never known that person or had their phone number had I not been able, you know, to be friends with Clifton. So um, that was great. And then I have to mention, you know, as I, as I did before, Rosalind Carter is a very good friend of mine. We actually talked on the phone several times while I was writing this book. And she would give me stories, which are in the book, that you wouldn't be likely to uh, to read somewhere else. So uh, out of the 12, I had three people that I could really, you know, rely on. One one of the first ladies being in the book, Rosalind, and then um, two others who had grandmothers that are in the book. So I was, I'm very, very fortunate to, to call these people my friends and, and was very fortunate to to have them as a resource when I was writing this book. And I'm proud to say that so far I know of seven women that have joined the DAR as a result of me writing this book. Uh, one of them is Mary Jean Eisenhower. 
Another is my wife, Diane, and she's become very involved in the DAR. Yes. And then uh, I mentioned Nicholas Inman uh, before, who, who encouraged me to write the book. And he's got, uh, I believe it's four generations uh, from his family that joined from his daughter all the way up to uh, Nicholas's grandmother. So I'm very proud of that. Those are the ones that I know of. I just had a, a, a call from somebody uh, the other day, a couple of weeks ago, that told me that they had been a member uh, and that, the, you know, they are a member, but they had not been involved. And after reading my book, they've gotten back involved in the, in the DAR actively. So that was good to hear too. Well, that's great. And I'm really glad that you did this book. And I think it's very important. And it's just, it's brimming with information, whether you had a, an ancestor, a patriot ancestor or not. If you just want to learn some history and you want to find out about some really incredible women, it's the book to read. I did want to comment on the fact that this podcast is your history, your story. It's about telling stories. And when you mentioned that you're able to speak with Mary Eisenhower and Clifton Daniel uh, and Rosalind Carter, that's getting information through oral history and that is just rich it's so important and you're able to incorporate stories that you heard personally now how did writing this book larry impact you as an historian oh it certainly broadened uh, me as a historian tremendously as i mentioned before and i can't say this enough uh, words can't even express how much it enlightened me about first ladies and again how important that they they were and that they are in our uh, our nation's success um you know and uh and like i said their their husbands even getting to the presidency so i just feel like it's really exponentially expanded my my ability as a historian to be able to now talk about uh, these first ladies as in depth as I do uh, about their husbands and, and had about their husbands for, for years. Writing this book was certainly a, a, an education for me. And it wasn't just, again, it's not just the importance of the, the first ladies, but I learned so much about the, about them that I didn't know. Um, you know, as I mentioned, the, the, the pin that, that Mamie Eisenhower, uh, you know, had converted and, and, and worn. I mean, that's just a, that's just a cool story. And, you know, if you know me, I love these little things like that. I love the personal side of the presidents and first ladies and the stories in this book are, are geared that way. They're geared as personal stories. And again, many that you wouldn't be likely to, to be able to pick up some other book and find them in. So it just exponentially broadened my abilities as a presidential historian. Yeah, I can see that. You speak with such enthusiasm, not, not just about this book, but about history in general and specifically presidential history. Your enthusiasm, Larry, is contagious. Thank you. I know that you give talks, you display some of your memorabilia to groups and organizations and you know, just my interaction with you and, uh, you know, Kelly and I spending the day with you and Diane was just gave me an idea what a valuable resource you are to the history community. Those who know how important it is and are enthusiastic about talking about the past and telling it as a story. When we hear dates and names and maybe a timeline of events. It's great sort of as a guide through history, but it's really the stories that stick with us. It's the stories that make us think and ponder things. What was it like? What were people faced with? What were their challenges? What were their successes? And the way you speak, and, and, and it's, it's how much you enjoy it that comes across really powerfully. So I want you to tell us, what, what kind of things are you up to and how can people find out how to contact you and maybe arrange to have you come and speak or give a presentation even online? How, how can people get a hold of you and find out more about you, Larry? Well, thank you. Yeah, I, I do a lot of presentations. I love doing them. I, uh, as you mentioned, I bring memorabilia 
uh, related to the presidents and first ladies that I'm talking about. That's a tough job for me because uh, it's tough to uh, figure out which pieces I want to bring to a presentation because uh, I am enthusiastic and I, and I get that getting ready for a presentation. I'm like, oh, I want to take this and I want to take that. And I want to take this and, and I can't take all 8,000 pieces. So um, I, I, I laugh at myself over that because I'm in a dilemma every time I'm doing a presentation and saying, you know, OK, you got to you got to stop here with 30 pieces or 40 pieces or whatever. But I love doing that. I did want to say that, you know, I feel very blessed with what I'm able to do. I can't believe this is my life. I, I've made so many friends, you know, you and Kelly included, by doing what I do and meeting such great people and getting to know our presidents and first ladies. And as I mentioned, I love the personal side of the presidency. I've been so fortunate to, to have a president and first lady as two of my very close friends, uh, President and Mrs. Carter. And that's, that's also given me a whole nother insight, you know, to be personal friends with a president and first lady and see the personal side of them. You know, we've done so much with the Carters over the years. We've been friends for about 20 years. And what I, you know, what I see with all these presidents and first ladies, that they're people just like all of us. I think the public forgets that sometimes. I think they look at the president and first lady sometimes as a, as objects rather than people. And they're, they're people just like us. Many of them, ordinary people who are thrown into extraordinary circumstances and, and become the leaders of our nation. And that's awesome when you think about that. That's an awesome responsibility to put on an ordinary person. But all of our presidents and first ladies are ordinary people. They all have the same you know, same issues in life that we all have. You know, you look back on some of these before they got to the White House, you know, they're worried about paying their bills, just like we all worry about it, you know? And so I'm, I'm so fortunate to, again, do what I do. I love it. And that's why I'm enthusiastic about it. And I love to give the presentations, as as you mentioned, people can certainly go to my website at LarryCookHistorian.com. They can follow me on, on Facebook. You know, I have two Facebook pages, Larry Cook and then Larry Cook Historian. And then you could certainly, uh, you know, email me at lcookhistorian.com and contact me there and, and be glad to uh, do a presentation for your group. Um, and I do, this is one thing that a lot of people don't realize too, I have a, a large uh, repertoire of programs that I do because I talk about all of the presidents from George Washington, all the way up to our current President Biden. So my presentations can include any any of those uh, presidents or first ladies. So I have probably about 30 different programs that I do. I just was in Fayetteville, New York. We talked about Fayetteville a little bit, and I just did a presidents at the library presentation there where we talked about uh, five or six different presidents. And we have a lot of fun. I love interacting with the with the audience, and and I love questions. I always tell them at the beginning, please think of questions throughout this because I love the questions at the end. That's one of my favorite parts. And I just feel blessed again to to do what I do and be able to promote history. And I and I thank you and Kelly for what you do in promoting history. You really, with these podcasts, you're really getting the information out there to the people, and that's what we need to do. Well, thank you, and any opportunity to really have people like you on our podcast who are very passionate about history and preserving history and telling history. So how can people get a copy of your book, Symbols of Patriotism, First Ladies and Daughters of the American Revolution? Well, the best way to get a a signed copy, and I'm glad to inscribe it and sign it as well, is to go onto my website at LarryCookHistorian.com. And when you go on there, you will see a, uh, a prompt to order book. And if you just hit that, a, uh, a form comes up and you can fill out the form. I'll get notified that you ordered my book and we can get one shipped right out to you. Great. Larry, I want to thank you so much for, for your time. And I wish you the very best. And I know there's a lot of people out there who are going to enjoy your book and to hear all that you have to say at your presentations. Well, thank you. And thank you. And again, I, I thank you for having me on the show. Your podcasts are wonderful. 
And I'm going to say it again. Thank you for all that you and Kelly do for history. And I, I appreciate you visiting and, and seeing the collection as well. And we hope to see you real soon too. Thanks, James. Okay, Larry. Have a good day. You too. Thank bye, you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you for joining us for this episode of Your History, Your Story. You can connect with us on Facebook and YouTube at Your History, Your Story, or on Instagram and Twitter at YHYS Podcast. We'd love to hear from you if you have any questions, comments, or a story to tell. Be well and God bless.